Well, everyone, we have reached episode 200, and that's a little bit hard to believe because I still remember that first video that I filmed, so 200 videos later is a little bit overwhelming. I would like to thank everybody who gave me suggestions as to what episode 200 should be about, but I kept receiving the same one over and over again, and that was, what are my top 10 RC cars? And it's, it's hard for me to say, oh, these are my top 10 favorite RC cars, because it's like saying, what's your favorite child? You know, I, I really love all these cars, and it's hard for me to say, well, this one's better than this one, but what I can provide you with, instead of a top 10 best RC cars, is a top 10 most influential RC cars in my life. Now, top 10 most influential might sound a little bit silly, but as we get on, I think you'll understand why I chose that. Well, let's get started. Starting off the list is number 10, my Toyota Hilux High Lift. To give you a little backstory on this vehicle, I went to the hobby shop just after the F350 High Lift had come out and I put a deposit on it. Well, later on, I ended up buying an issue of RC Car Action and I saw that to me it was going to release this. So I immediately called the hobby shop and I said, no, I do not want that. I want the Hilux High Lift. So I bought that with the first paycheck I got straight out of my first job out of college, my first real job. I built it, I painted it to match my full size one, and then I drove it and I realized that it was just awful. This, uh, it's hard for me to not offend people when it comes to the high lift series of trucks because this one I think was actually the worst in terms of its proportions because it wasn't intended to be on this chassis. The F350 and even the Tundra fit the chassis a little bit better, but I was determined that I was going to make this thing as good as the Trailfinder 2, so I lowered the truck, I put better suspension on it. Actually, for a while, it even had a four-link kit, but you couldn't ever beat the fact that this thing had worse ground clearance than a pan car. The transmission sat so low, and I was just determined, absolutely blindly determined to make this thing good. Years of efforts and my, my transmission lift and my battery relocation and 3D printed wheels and all the cosmetic upgrades, and it has become one of my all-time favorite trail trucks. I don't think I've ever been out on a run without this truck. That doesn't mean I would ever recommend a Hilux High Lift. If you want something of this appearance, get a, get a Trailfinder 2. Don't ever think of this truck, but even though this truck has a lot of shortcomings, I absolutely love it. It is incredibly durable. It has never ever had a problem on the trail. The first thing I ever designed for an RC car were these vector wheels on this truck. It wears the first design ever from Ampro Engineering. Because of all the shortcomings and the effort that I put into this truck, I think it has earned a place on this list. Coming in at number nine, the Traxxas Ford Bronco. Let me take you back to the mid-1990s. I was working at a hobby shop when I was in high school, and it was a blast. I just remember all the cars that were on the shelves and how, how much fun it was to work on customers' cars and work with people coming in and trying to you know give my opinion on what cars to buy. And it was always great because people would come in and some people want a Midnight Pumpkin, other people would buy a Claude Buster, some people would buy a RC10 GT. They'd buy, oh, the Kyosho Land Max was a really awesome seller back then. And it was just really cool to see all the different people coming in and buying all these different cars. Then one day the Nitro Fortec and the T-Max came out. And that marked the end of people walking in and buying something more suited to them. That T-Max on that display, I remember in the window of the hobby shop, it was sitting there and it looked unbelievable. Giant chunky tires, eight freaking shock absorbers on it. Onboard starter, it was a nitro RC, you know, it was a nitro monster truck. And then the Fortec. On the box, it had its top speed listed out there. I want to say it was 45 or 50 miles an hour, which by today's standards, I'm sure you can buy something at Target that goes that fast. But back then, 50 miles per hour stamped and blazed on that box. That was the end of people walking in and saying, yeah, you know, I was looking at my first RC car. Uh, you know, that TA02 looks really cool. No, after that, ready to run Traxxas, they crushed it. Traxxas was selling out like crazy. And then the pumpkins no longer sold. The RC10s sat there. The TA02s, nobody bought on road to me as anymore. No one even really looked at the HPIs anymore because of those Traxxases. So for years, decades, I hated Traxxas. Not because their products were bad, but because they were just those ready to run 
instant gratification kits that I always associated with consumer-based RC cars. I never looked at the Traxxas. Not then, not now. And then one day I saw images of a 79 Ford Bronco. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, Tamiya finally did it. They finally listened. They made a spectacular scaler. And it wasn't Tamiya. It was Traxxas. Traxxas. But they did it. I mean, look at this car. Trust me, when I get my mind set on something, it's hard to change it. But when I saw the Bronco, I mean, this is a masterpiece. I know people nitpick the TRX4 and all these things. I'm not that picky. I think this entire thing as a package out of the box is near perfection. It is absolutely spectacular. The scale appearance of the body, the lockable diffs, the app on the cell phone. This is a rolling video game. The things it can do, the, the way it performs out of the box for that, for $450, this car is just unbelievable. I, I simply am blown away by Traxxas's ability to create this. Now, I'm still not a huge fan of the fact that it came this way. Although, granted, even if it hadn't come assembled and painted, this is exactly how I would have painted it anyway. Um, I like to build my cars, but uh, it's, it's... I love it. Coming in at number eight, the Tamiya FF01 Ford Mondeo. So I bought this car brand new. I had taken possession of quite a few old Macintosh computers from one of the schools I used to go to. They were getting rid of them all because they need to be refurbished and all that, so I was taking them repairing them all myself and then selling them so in doing so you know they're probably selling them for like 20 or 30 dollars each but uh, over the course of a couple months i actually amassed enough money to buy a new rc car so i went to the hobby shop and i was really set on the ta01 i believe it was skyline because it was a really pretty car and it was on the on-road chassis that i thought looked amazing but when i walked in they were putting this car's box on the shelf. I still have the sticker that was on that box. So yes, I paid $159 for the car, and I even had enough money to buy a Novak Explorer. I think it was it was the first Explorer, the Explorer Sport, brand new for this car. So not only did I have a brand new car, this was my fourth RC car, I had a brand new car with an electronic speed control. In fact, it's one of the few cars that has the same ESC in it now that it had when I first bought it. I drove, and still do, but I, when I first got this car, I went through, I want to say I went through a set of tires a month for about a year. I would just drive this car nonstop. Now, this is not the original body. The original body is in pretty good shape, actually. I think it has one crack in the bumper here, and that's about it. Um, but I just adored this car. It's a front-wheel drive car. For those of you not familiar with the FF01, the motor is positioned directly in front of the drive wheels. And there really weren't that many upgrades available for it. There was a rear sway bar kit available for the TA02. And I tried to put it on this, and I did. And I started messing with camber and toe and the sway bar links at the rear, trying to mount a sway bar to the front, positioning weight in the front versus the back, different kinds of tires. And this was really the first time that I started to dive into the car's technical specifications as much as possible just to get the car to behave the way I wanted it to. And for that reason alone, this car here helped me to better understand the dynamics of a vehicle. So not only that, but I just always adored the way this car looked. Um, I do also have the box art body for this car as well. And this is just my own non-box art paint job because I've never really been a massive fan of box art. But... An absolutely remarkable little car. I love this thing. At number seven, the Nico Turbo Panther. So this car was my first ever brand new RC car, and I received it for Christmas one year. I initially received the white one, but when I put the batteries in it, the car was glitching like crazy. It was, the thing was hardly working, and the switch over here, I was trying to get the car to move, and the switch was having difficulty just cut staying in low or high. I remember I, I nudged the back of the car with my foot. I didn't kick it or anything, but I just nudged it and the whole switch fell off. So I, uh, I told my mom, I said, this car doesn't really work. So we took it back to the Toys, it was Toys R Us back then. Uh, they didn't have any more white ones, so we bought the red one. Now this thing looks to be in perfect shape, but I can assure you that simply because I've restored the car, this thing was utterly ruined a few years ago. But I don't see that as a bad thing, you know. Although the cosmetics were a trash, these, these bodies did not survive well because they're very hard plastic. Its electronics are original. They 
still work really well. It really doesn't glitch. Um, the transmission's in good shape. The suspension's in good shape. I mean, this car really survived an eight-year-old beating the heck out of it constantly and never really gave up. And, you know, it was one of those things where even back then there was this big divide be between consumer uh, RC cars and more of the hobby level RC cars. And I never understood what the big deal was because it was an RC car. It was just a cheaper one because that was all my parents could afford. And you better believe that I was happy with it. And this was where it all started for me. I mean, I had those cars that went forward and that you know, back up and turn, but this was the first time that I had a full function RC car. And the reason why it's not a little bit higher on the list is because we're used to batteries charging in minutes now. Well, in the case of this car, it would take, as I recall, four to six hours to charge the 600 milliamp NICAD batteries. So I only had one set. Six hours to an eight-year-old is about 40 years. So you'd run the car for six or seven minutes, the batteries would die, and then you had to plug it in and charge it. And um, oh, it was just, that was, that was awful. That was excruciating. But the car, this is really Genesis for me. This was, this was it. Coming in at number six, the Blackfoot. The first time I saw the Blackfoot was in one of the old, to me a catalogs that a friend of mine gave me. And I remember looking at this truck and I went, oh my God, it's amazing. I mean, monster trucks were all the rage in the 1980s. And that's what this truck was. And yeah, the Claude Busters got the bigger tires and all that, but this thing was just amazing. I always thought the body looked great. It's proportioned to the actual chassis I thought looked great. Unfortunately, by the time I was actually in the hobby, especially able to afford something, this truck was long gone but I always, always wanted one. Now, my first Blackfoot-based car actually was the Monster Beetle, but it was really the Blackfoot that I desperately wanted. My original Monster Beetle lived for years with this Super Blackfoot body on it. The Blackfoot always had this look about it. And I remember my Monster Beetle was the first vehicle I ever raced. And that was when I learned that although an RC car may look good, it may not... <laughs> It may, you know where I'm going with this. It may not actually be good. The Blackfoot was plagued with problems. The suspension was suspension. It was mediocre at best. But my Monster Beetle, what effectively killed that car was the differential. I, I mean, no, one's, no one is surprised that I just turned this thing around. It was absolutely the differential. This truck... And the issues with the the issues with the Monster Beetle and the ORV as a whole is what led me into buying my King Blackfoot. But this was, I think, one of the first RC cars that I was visually in love with. I thought it looked spectacular, and it has simply never gotten old for me. When I was in fourth and fifth grade, my school used to have these book sales uh, in the cafeteria where I don't know what company, but they would come in and set up like a little library and all that. And I would go there with my mom, and, uh, you know, my mom was always kind enough to let me buy a couple of books. And uh, <laughs> to help try and broaden my interests, you know, away from toy cars. So I bought this, this here. It does say, more radio control uh, action cars. The original book right here is radio controlled action cars. And it's a shameless plug for RC cars. Uh, it's amazing. Let's try to go to a page here. Like for example, it'll have this this spread right here on the Royal. Right, this is the Royal Royal Products Corporation Crusher, and it would tell you a little bit about it and uh, so on and so forth. Like for example, here uh, the Kyosho Turbo Optima, and it was just unbelievable to me. I mean, I didn't even know RC car action was a thing. I always I always loved this image here. Now it turns out that all of these photos, to my knowledge, are pulled straight out of RC car action. At the time, I had my Tycho Bandit, which I loved, and skimming through the pages one day, I saw this right there. Now, this is a build series on RC Car Action. My Tycho Bandit is the exact same body as the Nissan King Cab. So I saw that and I thought to myself, I have to have that car. Now, although uh, when I first saw this, it was on sale, there's no way that I would have been able to afford a King Cab. It was a couple more years before I would actually see my first hobby grade RC car. But this, this image of this King Cab never left my head. So I've always, always, always wanted a King Cab. And it's quite an ironic car because although its cosmetics can be kind of hit or miss to certain people, I know some people think that, you know, it's 
too tall to be a stadium truck. And others say, well, it's not tall enough to be a monster truck. And the fact that the chassis is made out of actual glass, uh, the transmission is made out of actual, well, I can't say it on this channel. It's one of those cars where I just didn't care. I just did not care how bad anything on the car was because, man, it was awesome. And the image of this thing here has never left. So this car was always that car that, you know, kept you dreaming of one day, one day. Number four, my pumpkin. This is the first brand new hobby grade RC car I ever got. I believe this was my 12th or 13th birthday. I want to say it's my 12th birthday. And I just got the car. Couldn't afford a radio. Again, back then a radio was 50 or $60. It wasn't like they were today. It was the first time that I got to put the car together completely by myself. For several months it had bushings until I, I uh, sold enough computers or recycled enough aluminum cans to afford ball bearings. And ball bearings, mind you, were $2 per 5x11 bearing. And the little 5x8 bearing was $7 by itself. So ball bearings back then cost a lot. And the bearings on this one are not the ones that <laughs> are not actually the ones from back then because there was a slight incident with a glitch and the ocean. The Midnight Pumpkin was always one of those cars that I loved taking out for walks because you could just drive it alongside of you and it kind of behaved like a dog. Right? I mean, it would sit there happily following you and then it saw a squirrel and it'd pop a wheelie and take off, right? It's always fun. It's like it's like the best car to drive on the grass. Anybody with this, you know what you mean. You know what? You have to own one to understand why the Midnight Pumpkin is the greatest vehicle to drive on the grass because it, it's not capable of just going on the grass. It does this like hop thing constantly. The fact that it pops wheelies is just icing on the cake. Fine, the suspension's terrible. The steering is a joke. The, every geometry on it's weird. It doesn't matter. This car is proof that RC cars are fundamentally fun. And that is one of the best compliments I could say about the hobby. Now, number three might surprise some people. My original Hornet. Coming in at number three is by no means an insult to the car. The Hornet is potentially my all-time favorite RC car because it does accompany that fun factor of the Midnight Pumpkin with this look. I just, in my book, all RC buggies should look like this. I think this is absolutely beautiful. At the office, I have one of my Hornets over there and I drive the car every single day. The car is insanely easy to build. It's easy to maintain. It's utterly indestructible. The car, in fact, has influenced me so much that it spawned Superfly. And let us, of course, not forget Superfly 2.0. I always wanted to race a Hornet. In fact, I did very briefly when I was a sponsored driver for Novak. Uh, it's a long story, but, but the condensed version is I was winning all of my classes and they wanted to move me into the pro group where I simply didn't have the, the funds uh, and the components to compete. So I asked if I could drive my sister's Super Hornet, she happened to be there that day, in that class. And they said, uh, sure, why not? And I didn't win, but I came in third place with a Super Hornet against RC10s and, and low Z triple X's and, you know, good cars. But I always, always, always just thought this would be the world's greatest race car because look at it. It just looks like a race car. And slowly but surely, you know, it makes me wonder what will Superfly 3 look like? So this car is actually my first Hornet. At least it's most of it. Some of my first Hornet like the chassis is right here. But the vast majority of this car is actually my first Tamiya Hornet. Although the body is not. I got the car used and the body was trash. So I ended up finding a new old stock body on eBay when eBay first started. And um, well, we don't, we don't speak of what happened to that body. A truly remarkable little car and quite possibly the reason why Ampro is the way it is. If the Hornet was a surprise to be at number three, then number two is no surprise. The Tyco Bandit. People tell me all the time how amazing the Tamiya Vintage promotional videos are, and yeah, they were awesome. But they were no Tyco Bandit commercial, that's for sure. Tyco had this ability that Nico simply did not, let alone Radio Shack or Tandy, to make their cars look unbelievable in their commercials. The Turbo Bandit, the Typhoon, the Turbo Hopper, the Heads Up Turbo Hopper, all their slot cars, 
man, Tyco could advertise. The thing is, it wasn't just hollow advertising. This was an awesome RC car. The Tyco Bandit was quick. And I don't mean quick for what it was. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's faster than a stock grasshopper by a long shot. These cars were made remarkably well too. Their electronics were bulletproof. You're finding more and more issues with them now, but the cars are going on 30 years of age. And, you know, they were, I don't want to say cheap because these cars were 60 or $70 back in the late 1980s, but they were more inexpensive than the hobby grade. But these consumer level RC cars in the 1980s, it wasn't just the golden age of hobby RC cars. It was the golden age of all RC cars. And this one here is one of the greatest RC cars ever made, both in terms of its looks, its off-road performance, its speed, its reliability. And these cars are starting to finally get some respect because the people that were little kids back when these things were available are now adults and they want their old car back. Now, I never owned this car brand new. I had two Tyco Bandits, both of which I still have. Both were used. Both were in horrendous shape, but when I'd seen those advertisements for this car, I was enamored. I had to have them, and when I finally found kids at school that wanted to get rid of them for $10 and $20, despite their condition, I absolutely had to buy this car. And, and I drove my Bandits well through high school because Project Bandit here used to be the tow truck with a little trailer behind it for my RC10. So anytime I would take the RC10 somewhere, which is usually to the school next to my house, I'd have a trailer on this and I would tow it there with the Bandit. This car is an all time favorite for me and I am almost insulted that it isn't number one, but number one beats out all the cars by miles. Before we hit number one, I do have some runners up. The New Bright Stock Car Series. Horrible electronics, a terrible motor, Terrible battery life, quite nice looking, but overall, what a piece of shit. The Trailfinder 2, the greatest Tamiya they never made. The new Willys Wheeler. Proof that Tamiya hates me. The Team Associated RC10 B2, the greatest modern buggy of all time. Also, it's the only modern buggy I've ever driven. The Rising Fighter. This is what happens when you name the car the wrong thing and miss out on cashing in on another car's name. Okay, we're almost ready to unveil number one, but I did want to mention a couple things before we get there. So a few things are going to be changing at Ampro. A lot of my designs are getting larger and larger, and unfortunately, on Shapeways, these parts are becoming more and more expensive due to their size. And a lot of these large parts don't need to be as detailed as Shapeways can provide. So what's going to be happening very soon is a lot of our larger parts, yes, including the interior set for the Traxxas Ford Bronco, the interior set for the Tamiya Ranger up there, will be available on my mini factory within the next couple of weeks to allow people access to these files to print the larger parts and the bulkier parts on their home printers at a dramatically reduced rate. So that is coming very, very soon. And another thing, uh, I get so many requests on, can you make this? Can you make that? Hey, there's this cool RC car. Can you look at that? Can you do this? And how I wish I could say yes to all of you. Unfortunately, Ampro Engineering is a separate entity and um, all the funds that I raise through Ampro Engineering are what I use to build Ampro Engineering. And unfortunately, a lot of the uh, requests I've been getting are simply not economically feasible. So I will be setting up a Patreon page if you are interested at all in helping to fund some of these crazy projects. The main issue that I'm having lately is that the projects are getting bigger and uh, that's, that's great. I love doing it, but the bigger projects mean bigger price tags, which basically mean things take longer because I try and keep, like I said, I try and keep all that money there. So if this is something that interests you and you'd like to continue to pursue this, you know, it'll be there again in the next couple of weeks. So with that, let's take a look at number one my RC10. There was a kid that lived down the street from my grandparents' house. Kind of a weird kid, weird family. He was friendly enough. And I had my Nico Turbo Panther and I was just driving it around my grandparents' front yard. And this kid came uh, rolling up on his bicycle, which we did back then. We had bicycles and we went like, you know, exploring by ourselves because that was okay in the 1980s. No one was as paranoid as they are now. I sound so old. He said, hey, my dad's got this RC car. You think you can fix it? Sure, why not? So he brings this over. And um, it was dirty, but I said, yeah, I can take a shot at working on it. I've never had one before, but let's 
let's look at it. Did some work to the car, went to the hobby shop. I think I had to buy crystals for it. He gave me a radio, which I still have as well. And I got the car running and the bill was quite hefty. It was about $17. Now granted, $17 today is less than it was then, but it was still $17. And uh, the kid told his dad, who proceeded to actually lay an egg. And he said, I'm not paying for that, keep it. Job well done. This car is extensively upgraded. It's got the wider track modern front suspension on it. In fact, it also has the stealth transmission in it. It's now got a full 2.4 gigahertz setup with a ridiculous brushless motor in here. MIP CVDs at the rear, uh, hardened steel turnbuckles, RPM ball cups, uh, the titanium ball studs. I mean, this car is every upgrade I could possibly get on it. And in fact, this was my first car that I professionally raced. I had so many spare parts that I was able to, with only a few extra parts, rebuild the original way that this car looked. So this body on this car was my second ever paint job attempt, and this was using correct paint. This body was painted in 19... Whenever Kinwald was first world champion with his original RC10, because as you can tell, I painted it quite similar to Brian Kinwald's car. The front suspension is my original suspension. All the turnbuckles here are my original ones. These shocks are my original ones. The transmission, however, this was a six gear RC10. No, no, I don't run six gear RC10s. I run the Stealth. So even this car here has got a Stealth in it, although the car actually is an early RC10. My original Novak M5 is in here. My original receiver is in here. It's as original as I could possibly make this car to the way I first received it. But the question is, why is this car so important to me? I really attribute my current career to this RC car. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Ampro Engineering is not my job. It'd be cool, but it isn't. I am a mechanical engineer. I'm very fortunate to be a mechanical engineer in the Bay Area in California because we produce consumer electronics and consumer products for the world. Unfortunately, due to non-disclosure agreements, I can't tell you what I've designed, but I guarantee you, you've probably got something that me or the company I work for has designed. In fact, I guarantee that you've got many things that we've designed. As a kid, I tore this car apart a thousand times. I tried to get things to work. I had the old six gear transmission, so I'd modified that transmission before, taking apart motors, figuring out why the receiver was glitching, adjusting the, the wing angle at the back of the thing to get the thing to go faster. Uh, for the longest time, I only had this in the Hornet. So, you know, this is my on-road car, my off-road car. So changing the tires, swapping the bodies out for different things. My original body I still have is a blue Volkswagen Beetle body. Built body mounts for that. Figured out how to rebuild the shock absorbers. It was the car that got me to tinker. Trust me, a lot of these tinkerings were failures. But the fact of the matter is, is it got me to take stuff apart, put it back together, change stuff, modify stuff. I completely attribute this car to why I am a mechanical engineer today because without this fueling, that fire that I had, that desire to fix stuff and modify stuff, who knows, maybe I wouldn't have gotten into RC cars, I wouldn't have gotten into big cars. <sighs> Boy, that sounds a lot easier. So thank you all so much for watching. It's been 200 episodes. Um, it's It's been a lot of fun. I've had a great time designing these parts and, and making these films. And, you know, and I, I do my best to reply to my messages on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. But it's gotten to the point now where there are just thousands and thousands of emails and comments and and messages so I, I apologize if I take too long or if I forget to get back to you again I really apologize I do believe firmly that uh, people that take the time to post something on my page deserve a response and I, I certainly do the best I possibly can even if it is a thumbs up or a little like you know because without everybody out there you know this channel would be nothing the you know my 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 parts designing yeah they'd be fun but you know, for me, it's so much more fun to see somebody else's version of what I've done. Without everybody here watching, it, it, this channel would be nothing. So again, thank you all for getting through 200 episodes. You know, and a big thanks goes out to my to my my wife and and my family because again, they're you know they're also that fuel that helps this nonsense continue to be a source of enjoyment. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.